In chapter 4, section 7, we'll look at optimization problems. These are kind of interesting because they tend to be real-world problems that could actually be seen in like a business setting or a manufacturing setting where you're trying to maximize things, um, minimize things, so a very practical use for calculus. So we have in problem 1, a store has been selling 100 Blu-ray discs over players a week at 550 each. A market survey indicates that for each $10 rebate offered to buyers, the number of units sold will increase by 20 a week. Find the demand function and the revenue function. How large a rebate should the store offer to maximize its revenue? So the first question says, if X is the number of Blu-ray players sold per week, then the weekly increase in sales is what? Well, you just take X, the number sold, minus the baseline of 100. So whatever number they give here, the answer is X minus that. Then it says for each increase of 20 units sold, the price is decreased by $10. So for each additional unit sold, the decrease in price will be 1 over 20 times 10. And the demand function is 550 minus, uh, you just have to do this arithmetic here, whatever they have for your problem. This would be 10 over 20, which is 0.5. Okay, and then we're going to say that that is, uh, so this is now uh, point slope form. We have x minus 100 equals 600 minus the slope, which would be 0.5x. Okay, so that's the price function. The revenue function is taking your price, p of x, times the number of units sold. Well, the number of units sold is x. So you take your price function, which we just derived up here, and you just multiply it by x. So we get 600x minus 0.5x squared. And then we will say, now we're gonna take the derivative of this to find the uh, best price to have these at for maximum revenue. So you take a derivative, 600x becomes 600, minus 0.5x squared becomes, bring the two down, double 0.5 becomes one, and then you subtract one from the two, it becomes one as well. So it's one x to the one. And to solve, we set that equal to zero. And we're gonna get the derivative equals zero, one x is 600. So it's a pretty simple equation, 600 minus x equals zero, therefore x equals 600. Okay, now that is going to be the point where, um, So basically we have a price function and a revenue function. And when price is zero, you make zero dollars. And when price gets too high, you make zero dollars. So somewhere in between those, this is an inverted parabola, there is what's called a max, max revenue. And that is the price that we want to set this at. So this is the price to make a max revenue. Well, we found X to be 600. That's not the price though. So that's the number of units sold. So we plug this 600 back into the price equation. Um, so we put that into, where's our price equation? Uh, it's back here. Okay, so this 600 is going to go into this price equation. And you're going to get 600 minus half of 600, which is 300. And so we'll get the unit price to be 300. And so if we want the unit price to be 300 to get maximum revenue, we give them a rebate of $250. So they had the price at 250. We're going to subtract, excuse me, they had the price at 550. We're going to subtract 250 off of that to make it 300 because that's the price where we're gonna get maximum revenue. So it's kind of interesting, in economics, you can't just charge the highest price and expect to get the highest revenue. That's not the case. So you actually wanna know these curves of demand and price, and you wanna find this maximum point. That's very key in economics. So um, basically, it's supply and demand. So if you charge too much, you don't sell as many, and so your revenue goes down. So you gotta find the derivative of the revenue function set it equal to zero, and that's where your maximum revenue will occur. Okay, so that's problem one. There's not a lot of 
arithmetic involved, or algebra, uh, I should say calculus involved, one derivative. Um, so we won't have to spend too much time on that problem. Let's look at two. This is where it's going to start to get more interesting. So in problem two it says, if 1,200 cent, uh, square centimeters of material is available to make a box with a square base and an open top, find the largest possible volume of the box. So basically we have this situation. We have a box and it's open on the top. And the base is x and the width is x. It's a square base and the height is not square. It doesn't have to be square. So it can be any height. And we want the largest possible volume. Well volume of a box like this is length times width times height. But in our case the length is x, the width is x, and the height is height. So we get the volume is equal to x squared h. Okay, In these problems it's always two equations. You solve one and plug it into the other. That's going to be the, the approach in every one. So this is really equation one. We need a second equation and that's going to come from this, the surface area. So you have to look a little carefully at this. What would be the surface area? The surface area is equal to the base, which is x times x, or x squared, plus we have four sides that all have the same dimensions, x times h. Okay, so imagine um, x squared is this base here. I should use a different color here. And then the four xh's are these sides. So this side, the back side, and then this side over here, and then the one facing us. So those four sides all have the dimensions x times h. And it tells us that that surface area is 1,200 square centimeters. So what we want to do is we want to solve for h. We basically want to solve for h in equation 2 and then plug it into equation 1. We want equation 1 with just one letter, not two. So if you look at this, we're going to subtract x squared from both sides and then divide by 4x, that would be h. And we're going to plug that in right there. So we're going to get the volume is equal to x squared times 1200 minus x squared over 4x. And this is going to equal, this x squared is going to take out this one of these x's on the bottom so I'm going to be left with um, 1200x minus x to the third all over 4, which we're going to write as 300x minus 1 fourth x cubed. Okay, that is the volume, if I have not made an error here. So this x squared goes down by 1x, cancels, let me actually show that. So one of these cancels with that one. Then this lone x will go up here and add to that. And then, so that gets us this step here in the middle. And then just divide both terms by 4 to clear out the bottom. Okay, now, the next step is also always taking a derivative. So we have the volume function. Now we have to find v prime, the derivative. Well, that's going to be 300 minus 3 fourths x squared. So with 300x, the x just goes away. With 1 fourth x to the third, the 3 comes into the 1. And then we subtract 1 from the 3 and make it a 2. And then to find a maximum, so basically again, x and volume, it's going to be parabolic. So if x is 0, you have no volume. If x is too big, you can't make a box out of it. But there's a sweet spot right somewhere in the middle here, uh, x, um, c, critical x, where this is maximum. Well, what do we notice about x critical? The slope of the tangent line is 0. So the derivative at that point is 0. So what we do to find that x value is set this equal to 0. So we say 0 must equal 300 minus 3 quarters x squared 
add 3 quarters x squared to both sides, divide both sides by 3, and multiply by 4, you should get x squared equals 400, which means x equals plus or minus 20. So we take x is equal to the square root of 400. Now we can throw out x equal to negative 20 because this is a real problem. It has real dimensions, so you're not going to use negative values for a length. So this is 20 centimeters. Okay, and then we want to find h. So to find h, we're going to, and this is also what we do in every problem, we back substitute into this, the equation for h. So we say h should equal 1200 minus 20 squared over 4 times 20. And if you do this, you should get for this problem, the height of the box needs to be 10 centimeters. Okay, but you're still not done because they want the actual volume. So the volume is going to be x squared, which is 20 centimeters squared, times the height, which is 10 centimeters. So that's going to be 400 times 10 is 4,000. Now units are important here. This squared is going to give you centimeters squared, but then you're still timesing it by centimeters, so you get centimeters to the third power. So, and that should be uh, what we expect. A regular length is in centimeters. An area should be centimeters squared. And a volume should be centimeters cubed. Or whatever your measurement unit is. So it's to the first power, to the second power, to the third power, as we go from one dimension, two dimensions, and then three dimensions. Okay, so that would be problem two. It looks like a lot, um, but this is the steps we're going to take in all the problems. We'll come up with two equations, substitute one into the other, take a derivative, set it equal to zero, solve for the variable, back substitute for the other variable. So hopefully you will get the hang of this as you practice more. Okay, problem two says find the dimensions of a rectangle with perimeter 116 whose area is as large as possible. If both values are the same number, enter it in both lengths. So we have a rectangle. It has a length, a length, a width, and a width. And therefore the perimeter is those four sides added up. So there's two L's plus two W's. And that has to equal 116. And we want the maximum area, which is just length times width. So just like before, in this case we have equation 1 is this, equation 2 is this, actually let me change that a little bit. Let's use the one with a number in it. Equation 1 is this one, equation 2 is that one. So from equation 1 we have to solve for one of the letters, does not matter which one. I'm going to solve it the same way I did in my notes. I solve for L, so I said um, L equals 116 minus 2W over 2. So subtract 2w from both sides and then divide by 2 to isolate 1l. Then we're going to put that into here. So area is really 116 minus 2w over 2 times w, which is going to give us 116w minus 2w squared over 2. Oh, I think we can simplify that, can't we? Let's do it. 116 over 2 is 58. And we can divide 2 into 2 and make it w squared. So that's a little simpler, no fraction anymore. Divide both terms by 2. Now we're going to take a derivative of this. Fairly simple derivative. 58 minus 2w. We're going to set that equal to 0, because that will give us our critical width. Add 2w to both sides, divide both sides by 2, and we should get the width is 29, what are the units here? Meters. And so now we're going to take this 29 meters and sub it back into the L formula to solve for L. So it's 116 minus 2 times 29 all over 2. 
This is 116 minus 58 over 2. This is 58 over 2. This is also 29 meters, which is always the case. So the most efficient uh, rectangle is in fact a square. So you're going to get the same numbers um, no matter what. If you want the most largest area for the smallest perimeter is a square. Okay, that's number three. Number four, oh, this one's kind of interesting. We have a boat leaves a dock at 5 p.m. and travels due south at a speed of 20 kilometers per hour. So the boat's going down. It's traveling 20 kilometers per hour. Another boat has been heading due east at 15 kilometers per hour and reaches the same dock at 6 p.m. So another boat's been traveling this way east and it's and this is 90 degrees because it's due east and due south and it says it's traveling at 15 kilometers per hour okay how many minutes after 5 p.m. were the two boats closest together so this thing left at 5 p.m. it got to the dock at 6 p.m. which is one hour but we're looking for some time in between this 5 and 6 p.m. interval where the boats were closest together. Is that how it was? Yeah, the two boats closest together. So there's some point in here, let's say something like this, and let's say this boat's a little faster, so let's say it's a little further away, like down here. There's some point in here where these two boats have the closest distance. So this is, how do I want to write this? We're going to call this distance as a function of time. Okay, well, this is a right triangle. So we have uh, these two uh, lines are perpendicular, and so this is a right triangle, and so we can use Pythagorean theorem. We can square both sides, add them up, and that will provide the distance. Okay, but this is the hard part to reason, and we have to convert these to distances, not to uh, rates. So right now these are in rates, 20 kilometers per hour. Um, they're not in distance. To make this distance, we're going to take this rate times the time the boat's been going traveling that way. So we're going to say that this boat going south has been traveling t units. So we're going to say this distance is just the 20 kilometers per hour times time, which we're just going to say is t, which we don't know. Okay, therefore, this boat over here is going to be going 15 kilometers per hour times, we know its total travel time is 1. So we're going to say that its, its time uh, has been t minus 1. So we're going to say, where can I write this? This distance this boat has traveled is 15 kilometers per hour times time minus 1. Okay. okay, now those green ones are true distances. So we're going to use Pythagorean theorem which says the distance, the hypotenuse which we call d of t, the distance between them squared, is equal to 15 t minus 1 squared, that leg of the triangle, plus 20t squared, that second leg of the triangle. And therefore d of t squared equals 15 squared, which is 225, times t minus 1 squared plus 400t squared. And you do need to FOIL this out. This equals 225t. It's going to be minus 1t minus the second t, which is minus 2t. Minus 2t times 225 is minus 450t. Then it's plus 1 times 225, so it's plus 225. Then it's plus 400t squared. So the distance squared is equal to... 625, oops, I missed something here. This should have been t squared. t squared 
<clears throat> minus 450t plus 225. And we're actually going to take the derivative of that. So technically, uh, our left side is the distance squared. Well, it turns out if we minimize the distance squared, we're also minimizing the distance itself. And we don't want to take a square root because that's going to make the derivative ugly. So we're going to take the derivative with respect to time of the distance squared. So we're taking the derivative of this, which is going to equal 1250t minus 450. And the 225 will go away. And we're going to set that equal to 0. So we add 450 to both sides. And then we're going to divide by 1250. And the time is going to equal uh, 0.36. But that's in hours. So to get the time in minutes, which is what they want, we're going to take 0 0.36 times 60 minutes per one hour. And we're going to get this is approximately 21.6 minutes, which I believe they want us to round to the nearest minute. So we call it 22 minutes. So 22 minutes after this boat uh, starts its journey towards the dock and this one leaves the dock, the two boats will be closest together. Okay, and that's problem four. Problem five, we have during summer months, Terry makes and sells necklaces on the beach. Last summer he sold the necklaces for $10 and his sales averaged $20 per day. When he increased the price by $1, he found that the average decreased by two sales per day. Find the demand function, price P as a function of units sold, assuming that it is linear. Okay, when they say that, linear, it means that we can come up with a straight line formula for the uh, price function. So what we're going to use is those two data points he gave us. So he says he sold 20 per day when the price is $10. Then it says, so we just captured this and this. When he increased the price by one, so it's going to go to $11, his sales went down by two. So instead of 20, it should be 18. And this is point one, and this is point two. So it's like we have, no, that's not what I want. I don't want it black. We have X, which is number sold. So let's see, we sold um, 18 and 20. And then the Y axis is the actual price. We have 10 and 11. Now you have to be careful here in how you line these up. The 18 goes with the 11 and the 20 goes with the 10. So we can see that this function goes down as x gets bigger. Okay, and we just need the slope of that line. So the slope of this line is the slope formula, which is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And in this problem, uh, we're going to call this point x1, y1, this point x2, y2. So we get $11 minus $10, and we get 18 units sold minus 20 units sold. So we get $1 on top, and we get negative 2 on the bottom, negative 2 units. And so our slope is negative 0.5. So basically for every uh, dollar increase, we lose two sales, which is what they said. Okay, so now uh, we need to find the actual equation of the line. The equation of the line is um, point slope form. So y minus y1 equals slope x minus x1. 
And so we'd get y minus y1 is $10 equals negative 0.5, the slope we just found, x minus x1, which is 20. So we get y minus $10 equals, distribute this 0 0.5, negative 0.5x minus a half times minus 20 is plus 10. Add those add the 10 over and you're going to get minus 0.5x plus 20 and that is the price function so it's negative 0.5x plus 20 that goes here now it says if the material for each nexus costs Terry eight dollars what should the selling price be to maximize his profit so profit in any business setting is capital P this is lowercase p for price it's equal to the revenue minus the cost. Well, the revenue is X, the number of units sold, times the price of each unit. And the cost is whatever we have to come up with that. So the cost function says what? Each necklace costs Terry $8. So the cost function is really simple. It's $8 times X. So the profit function is negative point, oops, uh, yeah, this is okay, negative 0.5x squared plus 20x. Now how did I get from here to there? It's x times px. So I just put an x on each of those terms, and then it's minus the cost, which is 8x. So his profit function is negative 0.5x squared plus 12x. And let's see, oh, to maximize the profit. So we have still got to go, keep going. To maximize profit, we take a derivative. And we're going to get minus 1x plus 12. Set that equal to 0. Add x to both sides. x should equal 12. So that is how many uh, units he should sell. Now we have to look at what, what will he charge then. So we plug that into little p of x, which said you take minus 0.5x plus 20. That's the pricing function. So we're plugging in 12. So it's minus 0.5 times 12 plus 20. This is minus 6 plus 20, which is 14. So he should charge $14, he should aim to sell 12 of them each day, and he will maximize his profit. Okay, and that's problem five. Okay, problem six, we've got a window that's rectangular but also circular, and we have the perimeter is 16 feet, find the maximum amount of light we can let through this window, which is just a way of saying what's the maximum area of the window. So if we look at this drawing, this Okay, this is also X. <clears throat> which means that this, that, the radius of this circle is one half x. So the hemisphere of this upper part of the window is governed by a radius that's one half x. Now the only thing that's, well, not the only thing, but one of the things that's also challenging about this window is we don't know the height. So we don't know that length. So we can come up with a perimeter equation, which would be this. You've got an X on the bottom, plus two H's, an H on this side, an H on this side, plus the, circ the circumference of this half circle. Well, the circumference of a circle is two pi R times the radius, but we have half of the circumference, so that's just pi R. When we take one half of that, the two goes away. But the R here is one half X. So this is pi times one half x. So we're adding also uh, one half pi x for the part portion of the circle. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to get 
the perimeter equals uh, 1 plus 1 half pi times x plus 2h. And that's equal to 16 feet. So you'll notice I factored out that common x between this term and this one. And plus 2h. Okay, once again, we have to solve for h. So we're going to say h is equal to <clears throat> 16 minus 1 plus 1 half pi times x all over 2. Then we're going to solve for the area. The area is just x times h for the rectangular portion of the window. And for the circular portion, area of a circle is pi r squared. But area of a half circle would be half of that, so it's 1 half pi r squared. But the radius of this circle is 1 half x, so it's 1 half x squared. So the area of the half circle, the hemisphere, is 1 half times 1 half squared, which is 1 fourth, so you get 1 eighth pi x squared. So we get plus 1 eighth pi x squared. <clears throat> but we need to plug in this h so that there's no h's, it's all x's. So a is x times 16, let's simplify this a bit. Let's call this 8 minus 1 half, 1 plus 1 half pi x. That way there's not so many fractions running around. So it's 8 minus 1 half, 1 plus 1 half pi times x plus 1 eighth pi x squared. Okay, and let's Maybe I shouldn't have combined these things, uh, separate out that x. Eh, might still work okay. Area is there for 8x minus 1 half 1 plus 1 half pi x squared plus 1 eighth pi x squared. And we want to take a derivative of that. So the derivative of this would be 8 minus this 2 is going to come out and cancel that half, so we're going to be left with 1 plus 1 half pi times x plus this 2 will go into this 1, 2 over 8 is 1 over 4 pi x. And we're going to set this equal to 0. So let's take a look, probably do want to distribute this back out so we can see. So 0 equals 8 minus 1, minus 1 half, ooh, minus 1x, careful, minus 1x, minus 1 half pi x, plus 1 quarter pi x. Now these two you can combine. Negative a half plus a quarter is negative a quarter pi x. So we get, let's move the x's to one side. We're going to have x plus one quarter pi x equals eight. Factor out x. x should equal 8 divided by 1 plus 1 quarter pi. And that's exactly what we have. So, um, it looks complicated. I hope it's not too bad. So you've got the two areas, a rectangle and a semicircle. And I showed you both those formulas. And you just have to be real careful about your algebra, your fractions, your uh, accounting, really. You want to make sure you 
um, are accounting for all these x's and fractions and for problem six. Okay, problem seven isn't as involved as that one. A model used for the yield y of an agricultural crop as a function of the nitrogen level n in the soil measured in appropriate units is yield equals kn over 49 plus n squared where k is a positive constant. What nitrogen level yield, what nitrogen level gives the best yield? So you actually just have to take the derivative of this equation outright. So we don't have to solve an equation for one letter and substitute it in for another letter. We're just going to take a, de a derivative. But to take the derivative of this, we have to use quotient rules. So we have to do fig minus gif over g squared, where f is the numerator kn, therefore f prime is just k, so the variable here, I should write this, is the nitrogen, so we're doing this as a function of nitrogen, and then little g is the denominator, 49 plus n squared, therefore g prime is 2n. 49 goes away in the derivative, n squared is 2n. So the derivative of this equation with respect to n is f prime, which is k, times g, which is 49 plus n squared, minus g prime, which is 2n, times f, which is kn, all over uh, 49 plus n squared squared. So on the top, we're going to get 49k plus kn squared. We're going to get minus 2kn squared. And on the bottom, we have 49 plus n squared squared. Now, just in all the other problems, we set the derivative equal to 0. We're going to do the same thing. So we're going to say let that equal 0. And I think we can combine kn squared, one of them, minus two of them, and get 49k minus 1kn squared, all over 49 plus n squared squared. Now here's the beauty. The, de the denominator is still complicated. You would have to FOIL that out to solve for it. But here's the nice thing. I'm just going to multiply both sides by the denominator, and the, because the left side is 0, it's going to go away. So in essence, all we have to solve for is when the numerator is equal to 0, and we can completely forget about the denominator. So we add kn squared to both sides, and we get this k to cancel that k, or you can say divide both sides by k. And then we get n squared equals 49. Therefore, n equals plus or minus 7. But it doesn't make sense to have a negative uh, nitrogen level so in soil. So we're going to have it just be positive 7, which will be the nitrogen level in what they say is the appropriate units. That'll be problem 7. Okay, problem 8 says a rectangular storage container with an open top is to have a volume of 10 meters cubed. The length of the base is twice the width. Material for the base costs $20 per square meter. Material for the sides costs $12 per square meter. Find the cost of the materials for the cheapest such containers. So, a very practical problem. You could imagine you're building a box for someone and you want it to be nice, but you want to save some money. So you look for the cheapest box you can make. And so we draw our box again. Now this problem is interesting. It says the length is twice the width. So if this is the width, this is two widths, the length. And it doesn't tell us the height, so we don't know that. So right away, since they gave us a volume number, let's calculate volume. It would be 2w, the length, times the width, which is w, times the height, which is h which is 2w squared h, and that's supposed to equal 10 cubic meters. So uh, right away we can solve for h, 
So we will say uh, h equals 10 over 2w squared, which is 5 over w squared. And we'll put that in our back pocket for now, because we know we generally have to solve for one of the two letters in these problems. Okay, now it's going to give us costs for things. So it's actually the cost function we're trying to minimize. And we just want to do it in terms of W. So the cost is going to be, the base has a different cost than the other sides. So this base is more expensive and they're making it $20 per square meter. So it's going to be $20 times what the base is, which is 2W times W, which is 2W squared. So the area of that base is 2W squared and it's being multiplied by $20. Okay, then it's going to be plus each of these sides, which there are four of them, those four are going to be uh, four sides times $12 per square foot times their areas, which are width times height, but we're going to replace height with 5 over w squared. So if you look at the dimensions on one of these sides, it's w and h. So you just multiply those two dimensions, but we replace h with this, which is in terms of w. So the cost function is 40. Let me drop the units of dollars and just write it as a number 40 w squared plus this is going to be 48 times 5. Do I have that number written down? Yes, I do. 48 times this 5 is 360. This W will cancel with one of those Ws, and so we're left with W on the bottom, so this is 36 divided by W. For the cost is 40W squared plus 360w to the minus 1 power. Just like before, we're going to take a derivative of this cost function and get 80w plus 360w to the minus 2. And I made an error there. Kudos to those of you who saw me make it in real time. When I take this derivative, this minus 1 comes down. So it's minus 1 times 360, which is minus 360. Then it's w to the minus 2. And we're going to set that equal to 0. So we get 80w minus 360 over w squared. And there's lots of ways you can do this problem. Let's add 360 over w squared to both sides. Let's multiply both sides by w squared which makes this side w cubed. Divide both sides by 80 and take a third root of 360 over 80 to solve for w. And the third root of 360 over 80 is uh, we have to do this in decimal form. Yep, decimal. 1.65 meters. So you might not know how to do this in your calculator. You would put 360 divided by 80 in parentheses and then you would do power key and you would do parentheses 1 over 3. Enter. If you don't have parentheses just do 360 divided by 80 get a number hit the power button on your calculator and type in 0 .33333 Okay, that will give you this answer for the width. Okay, what do they want though? They still want the actual cost. So we are actually going to take this 1.65 number and plug it back into this formula for the cost. So we'd say the cost of 1.65 meters worth of material for the width is 40, 1.65 squared, plus 360 divided by 1.65. And if you do this, you should get 
the cost at this length of the width should be three hundred and twenty seven dollars and eight cents now you do have to be careful about this because it's to the nearest penny so you have to I got away with only carrying two decimals you might want to carry three just to make sure that you, there's no chance of a rounding mistake or rounding error that's so it's close but not close enough for the computer to say it's good and that's problem eight okay problem nine uh, prob not probably I would argue the hardest problem in the set so buckle up Find the dimensions of the rectangle of largest area that can be inscribed in an equilateral triangle of side L if one side of the rectangle lies on the base of the triangle. So you have to draw an equilateral triangle. Equilateral means that the length of each side is L. Then within that, you have to draw a rectangle. So it's like, and see I kind of drew it incorrectly so that's the trick is where can you draw this thing okay let's try force where can you draw this thing where you get a rectangle in that equilateral triangle that's as big as possible okay so what we're going to do is we're going to chop this thing in half you don't have to do it this way but I kind of recommend it Let's look at just half of this thing. And the reason I want to look at half of it is because that forms a right triangle. In right triangles, we can use Sokotoa and Pythagorean theorem and all the nice uh, right triangle stuff that um, is very useful. So let's just blow that up. Let's say we have a right triangle, hypotenuse is L, and this is now one half L because that will split that exactly in half. And then this, we actually don't know. This we would call the height of the equilateral triangle. And then inside this thing, we have some unknown box, some rectangle. Okay, and I want to follow my notes, but I almost don't because I don't like what they look like. Uh, let me think about this. Okay. One thing we have to know is that an equilateral triangle, all of these angles are 60. But when I cut it in half, like I did over here, that's going to make these two 30. So this is a 30, 60, 90 triangle. And that's nice because that's going to immediately allow us to solve for this height right here. So based on a 30, 60, 90 triangle, in fact, let me not even introduce the letter H. Let's just look at this side of the triangle. The hypotenuse of the 30, 69 is always double the short side, which is the side across from the 30 degree angle. So we can see this is 1 half L, this is 1 L. It's double this, so that's true. The other side is always the square root of 3 times the short side of the triangle. So that's just something you have to remember or look up for a 30, 60, 90 triangle is that the ratio is um, whatever this number is, double it for this one and take this number times the square root of 3 for the other side. Okay, that's a huge step, just that, is getting those three sides. Okay, now we have an unknown, uh, let's call it x dimension here and y dimension here. Well, to solve for this, we are going to set up a similar triangle. So we're going to say this big triangle, which has dimensions L and root 3 over 2L and 1 half L, has to match up to this. Uh, let me do it in purple here. No, let me do it in red. This triangle. So these two triangles have the same uh, proportions. So we're going to say those two have to match up. And if we look, this dimension is x. And this dimension we don't have to know necessarily. We don't know what it is, the hypotenuse, but don't necessarily care. What we need to care about is this dimension. Well, if we call this dimension y, then this dimension here is, oh boy, 
it's root 3 over 2L minus Y. I know that might be kind of a stretch. So this whole thing is root 3 over 2L, and we call this green dimension Y, so this red dimension is the full dimension minus Y. Okay, now we can set up the ratio. We can say that, let me see if I can use color to help us, this length and this length have to be proportional. These two lengths have to be proportional. So we're going to say root 3 over 2L divided by its equivalent side, root 3 over 2L minus Y, has to be equal to this x dimension, 1 half L, divided by its corresponding side, x. Okay, so now we're going to get rid of fractions by cross multiplying. And we will get root 3 over 2 L times x has to equal 1 half times root 3 over 2 is going to be root 3 over 4 L times L is L squared minus 1 half L Y. And we want to solve for one of these letters. It doesn't really matter which one. Um, let's solve for x since it's already sitting right here. Pretty easy. So we're going to have x is equal to uh, root 3 over 4 l squared minus 1 half y l. We're going to multiply that whole thing by 2 over square root of 3, the reciprocal of that, and we're going to divide the whole thing by L to get rid of that L. So X is going to equal this root 3 and root 3 will cancel. 2 over 4 will become 1 half. L squared over L will just be L. So let me see if I can do all what I just said. That's 1 half L minus this root 3 is going to stick around now, but these 2's will cancel, this L will cancel, so it's minus 1 over root 3, Y. Okay, so let's do that again. These 2's cancel, the root 3 sticks around, this L cancels that L. So there's no more L, just a Y and a root 3 on the bottom, and those 2's are gone. Okay, so that's correct. But we want the area of the box. So we're looking for the area of uh, x and y. And we know x in terms of y. So we're going to say the area the area is equal to x times y. But we know x is 1 half L minus 1 over root 3 Y, that's x, times Y. So the area, did this slightly different than in my notes, I think this is actually better. The area is 1 half L Y minus 1 over root 3 y squared. And we want the derivative of that with respect to y, l is a constant, so we have 1 half l minus 2 over root 3 y. And we set that equal to 0, so we get 1 half l minus 2 over root 3 y. Add, oof, Lots of space yet. Add 2 over root 3y to both sides. Therefore, y has to equal, this is going to be root 3 over 4l. Okay, that is the most efficient height of the box. And then x is going to be from this equation substituted for y x equals 1 half l 
minus 1 over root 3 times y, but y is root 3 over 4L. So x is 1 half, I think I lost a letter there, L. L minus, these root 3's cancel, 1 quarter L. And 1 half L minus a quarter L is 1 quarter L, positive. Okay, so that is very, very close to the answer. The only thing is that that x is only half of this width. So that's x right there. We want the full width, so we have two x's. So the full base of that rectangle is actually two x's, which would be times two. So it's actually two over four L which is one half L. So that's two X's. So the base of the largest box should be L over two, one half L, and the height should be root three over four L. So, um, yes, I would consider this problem to be difficult. Um, very uh, probably very difficult because not a lot of students are going to be able to look at this and say oh I know what to do I'll cut this in half and use similar triangles and then find the ratio and and solve for one letter it, it's not easy um, but I've shown it to you now so the idea is could you recreate this with enough time and thinking about it now that you've seen it done once I would never in a million years expect a student to look at this problem cold, have never seen it before, and get very far. So um, do take your time with this one and reach out to me if you need help for problem nine. Okay, problem 10 is kind of one of these problems that um, I don't usually assign, but it kind of slipped in there, so we'll look at it. So you've got this, this cone here, and um, you can explore by adjusting this slider bar, the angle, and the volume of the cone. So you can kind of see there's a sweet spot. If you look at this volume down here, uh, let me circle this so you can kind of see it better. So you're trying to track two things. You're tracking this volume number and you're tracking the theta in radians as you move this slider bar. So watch what happens. As you move the slider bar, notice the volume number is going up. So it's 46, 47, 49, 4, 50, 50.2, 50.381, 35, that's smaller, so it's 50.383. I think that might be the best. So 1.16 and 50.383. Now that did not take me long to find that. Any other number you pick will get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it's zero. So if we come down here, we just have to report that. So we saw together that the theta that was the best was 1.16 and the volume was 50.383. Pretty simple to do that. Now does this also maximize the surface area of the cone? It would take a lot to explain why this is true, but it, it's, this is correct. It's not. So there's a whole different equation for the volume of a cone versus the surface area of a cone. And as we've learned, because they're different equations, their derivatives are different and it's the solution of the derivative set to zero that creates the answer for the um, angle or uh, the volume. That's the easy part. That took us 20 seconds. The harder part's finding what we call the exact solution. So this is a numerical solution. It's an approximate solution. To find the exact solution, we have to actually dive into the volume of a cone. So the volume of a right cone it's dependent on two things. One is the radius, and the other for this problem is dependent on this angle theta. And this is a right to, this is a right angle. And if you look it up, the volume of a cone, the volume of a cone is equal to pi r squared h over 3. But h is this 
is this length here. That's h. So it would be easy if this problem wanted to do it based on height or radius, but it wants that angle, which is a little harder to find. So we have to use um, Sokotoa. And this says that the sine of theta should be the opposite, which is r, over the hypotenuse, which um, is this, this side that we don't really care about. Um, so, actually, did they give us that? If they gave us that, then we can use it. Let me go back. They did. So they said that that side has to be fixed at 5. So notice however I changed the angle. This side right here, which is the hypotenuse, is always 5. So let me write that in because that's going to be hugely beneficial. Okay, therefore, we would write this as, not hypotenuse, not unknown, we're going to write that as the known value of 5. Oh, and I guess technically they're calling this theta over 2 because it's only half of that angle, so theta over 2. So this is actually theta over 2 equals the radius over 5. And therefore, we can solve for... Um, no, we can't. So we need to then use um, cosine of theta over 2 is, so we use so, now we're using ka. Ka stands for adjacent, I should be writing this, adjacent over hypotenuse. The adjacent side to this angle is that h that we were trying to solve for. And the hypotenuse is 5. So we can solve for this h. We're going to call that h, right here, is 5 times the cosine of theta over 2. Okay, so we can plug that into our V cone. So we're going to say V cone. Actually, we're going to do two substitutions. We're also going to solve for R. So R is 5 times sine of theta over 2. So we have pi. Instead of R, we're going to write 5 sine theta over 2, and we're squaring, uh, we're squaring that because of the square. And then it's times h, but h is 5 cosine theta over 2. And then in the formula, it's h over 3, so there's a 3 down here. So we get the volume of this cone is equal to pi, 5 squared, which is 25, sine squared theta over 2 times 5 thirds cosine theta over 2. And let's combine all of our constants. So V cone is equal to 125 pi over 3 times sine squared theta over 2 times cosine theta over 2. And as we've done in every problem, we are now going to take a derivative of this function. So we're going to say um, v prime is going to be now, we have two functions here. You know what, I just noticed in my notes I wrote, <laughs> I wrote, um, just use my answers. And what I meant for that was, uh, I think I decided when I was working this problem that it was too long for you to do and you should just record. These are going to be the answers. But the problem is if they change that 5 like they had in mind, they might not be the answer. So maybe I do need to show you this. So we can do it. Um, we have to use product rules. So basically we're going to get this. We're going to call this function f and this function g. And therefore, the derivative is going to be f prime g plus g prime f. So v cone, v prime cone, is 125 pi over 3. Now that's just a constant that can be totally outside of the thing. Times the derivative of f, which would be 2 sine 
beta over 2 times the derivative of sine, which is cosine beta over 2, times the derivative of theta over 2, which is, you no, know, no, let's not do this. Okay, so uh, this is going to be a complete mess. So don't worry about this problem. Use my answers. Um, it asks you to fill something in here. I don't, you don't have to. So because of that, um, you're only going to be able to get 0.83 out of 1 on this problem. So you're missing 0.17. At the end of the class in my master Excel sheet, I will add 0.17 to everyone's homework grade for points um, to account for the fact that um, I don't plan to go in and look at all of your answers here just because there's a lot of you and it's not that important really. Um, it just asks you what happens if we change the radius of the circle or um, it, it asks you to do some stuff on paper that I, I don't think you really need to uh, spend your time doing. Okay, so with that, uh, that will be problem 10, the last problem in section 4.7.